Yorgmar Thran Physician versus Rurik Thar the Unbowed, the Mimeoplasm, and Mazarek Kroll Death Priest. We are definitely keeping that because we can get into Genesis Chamber on turn one. I don't think anyone's going to be playing any creatures as quickly as we are. Okay, just a couple of lands from our opponents. Let's start things off with our Sol Ring, and we'll grab the Genesis Chamber as well. That'll give us some nice sack fodder with our commander. And we just need to hope that by the time our turn comes back around, our opponents haven't gone off with a bunch of creatures. It might be that any of our green opponents over here will get into turn one mana dorks, but doesn't look like it so far. Or turn two for these two players, I suppose. Alright, well, there's the first creature of the game. A Paradise Druid. I tend to see that a lot in Brawl, in my experience. Uh, it adds one mana of any colour, a 2 1. Okay. Let's go for our commander, I think. Drop a swamp. And we get a Genesis Chamber trigger, which leaves us with a mirror. We can actually go after the Paradise Druid if we want to. Oh no, we can't. It has hexproof. As long as it is untapped. So maybe if they tap it down for mana, we can take them off a of mana during their turn. A third green source for the Mimeoplasm. Hopefully they've got a Cultivate to fix their colours here. And they do. Kadama's Reach will do it. Get them into a swamp and an island. Uh, they put an island into play and a swamp into their hand. A third land for our opponent. So they've got four mana available to them here. I wonder if they're going to crack that myriad landscape or not. Well, they decide to not tap the Paradise Druid. They're going to have two mana available after the Manalith comes in. So there's still time for them to tap it yet. But deciding not to cast anything else, let's go for our Liliana here. The sooner we can get her out and start plussing her up, the sooner we can get up to her limit break, maybe. So let's plus. We don't want to play a swamp until we've shown our opponents that we've tutored for one. Just gives them less information as to what's in our hand. Throw a swamp into our hand and play it immediately. Can't get anything else down, unfortunately, but we can't exactly complain with the position we're in. So we'll just pass the turn like that. A Karozda Guild Mage. And if anyone's going to like the Genesis Chamber triggers, it's Mazarek. Plenty of sack fodder for them. This thing is going to give Intimidate and plus one plus one to a target creature. And then for four mana and sack a non-token creature, you get X Saprilings, where X is the creature's toughness. So the mirrors aren't going to help them out there. But they will be able to get a bunch of saprolings into play if they sacrifice their huge Mazarek. The Mimeoplasm is now on their Sultai colours. And they cultivate after the Kadama's reach, so... Definitely getting their ramp and fixing on. They may just go for Island and Swamp again. And again going for an Island and a Swamp. The Island goes into play tapped. Looks like all their basics match as well. Uh, Gaia's Skyfolk, that is a 2-2 flyer, so that is noteworthy with our Planeswalker in play. We might have everything turning sideways in at us anyway. Now that I'm thinking about it, this is a minus 6, isn't it? So what we could actually do is just next turn go for Yagmoth's Discard and Proliferate twice, get rid of these two lands, and then, yeah, so if we play a land, discard these two, Activate Yargmoth twice, proliferate Liliana twice, we can actually get the emblem next turn and that will make our swamps really, really good. So I think we've got a bit of a game plan here. Now a Rummaging Goblin coming into play, discard to draw. And now Rurik is in a tricky position here because they could tap down their two pieces of mana to put into Myriad Landscape here, but I'm sure they don't want to tap the Paradise Druid because it has Hexproof. I don't think they want to play around that for too long because they have to tap it eventually. They've got plenty of blockers in play already, so I think they're actually better off just going for the activation on the Myriad landscape here. But they can do it at the end of the um at the end of the Mimeoplasm's turn. Deciding to pass through to us. Okay, a petrified field. Uh yeah, I mean, we can actually make use of that if we want the Thespian Stage or the Volrath Stronghold, so that pretty much 
cements the idea of what we're about to do. There's not going to be any direct damage, so let's go discard a card. In fact, do we want to get rid of a creature here? No, I think I'd rather have the mirror to block. So we'll just proliferate on Liliana. Then we'll discard the Volas Stronghold as well. And then while we've got the chance, we'll get the emblem with Liliana. Now all of our swamps tap for four mana. So we've got four, eight, twelve, sixteen mana on our four basic swamps. So it's just a case of passing through to next turn and maybe sacrifice the mirror at the end of the Rurikthar's turn. But this is just showcasing how good the fast mana is here, really. Couldn't have done any of this without Sol Ring. But Sol Ring's in the format, so we're going to use it. I'm sure Sol Ring is in all of our opponent's decks as well. Winding Constrictor, and it looks like Mazarek is missing land drops. Everyone's getting chump blockers into play with the mere tokens, at least. Oracle of Muldaya for the Mimeoplasm. They're going to attempt to keep up with us on mana. And they have a Fairy Artisans. That is a really good card. Run this in Bruderclad. So we'll just have to shove that here. We'll put it there. Followed by a Sultai Charm. Draw two and discard. I don't know if they drew into a land there. We didn't see the second card that they drew into, but they've got Lightning Greaves on top now. I actually don't like that there. Uh, oh. Was the Lightning Greaves the second card on top? I don't know what happened there. It just suddenly changed to traverse the Outlands. Anyway, I was going to say I don't like that there, so I'm going to put it here. We can all remember that that is the Sultai player's pile of cards. The top of their library. Not swinging in with the Flyer. We've all got creatures in play that I'm sure everyone wants to keep back as blockers at this point, but we can't all be passive forever. I'm certainly going to start trying to get some kind of engine going at this point. Rummaging Goblin going for some kind of answer. They've got four cards in hand and discarded Fecundity. <laughs> yeah, you don't want Fecundity in play when we've got Genesis Chamber and a Sack Outlet in play. And I'm sure Mazarek has plenty of means of sacking creatures as well. Yeah, Fecundity is the last thing you want to be playing. Followed by a Gruel Key Rune, so everyone is just still ramping at this point. Hopefully Mazarek can keep up with us. And then finally cracking that Myriad Landscape. Still not tapping the Paradise Druid though. So they get their lands from the Myriad Landscape and just decide to pass the turn to us now that they are tapped out. Let's see what we draw into. A Swamp is even more mana, like we were struggling on that. Uh, let's go for Zulaport Cutthroat and the Dread Horde Invasion. And that triggers the Genesis Chamber again. Then let's see if we can get something going. We'll put a minus counter on Oracle. Get rid of the Summoning Sigmir. And that will drain everyone for one. And just have to really hope we draw into something good here. Uh, Machaeus the Unhallowed. Hmm. With a couple of humans in play. Let's go for something else here. Let's go after that Rummaging Goblin as well. We'll sack the Mir. Worst case scenario, we can just play Machaeus and get another Mir token. Okay, just getting into a land unfortunately, so let's play the Machaeus. And the Mir token has Undying, not that that counts on a... Um, on a token. We'll go after our opponent's Sack Outlet and sacrifice the Mir again. And this is why the Genesis Chamber is so good. The Undying does trigger on the token, but it doesn't come into effect because as soon as it hits the bin, it evaporates. And if it doesn't count as being in the game anymore, it can't come back from the graveyard. We'll draw a card here. Put in as many minus counters on as many things as possible while clearing a couple of lands off the top. Well, it's discard fodder at least. We don't need an Ancient Tomb. Oh, and how did we get rid of that? We only put one minus counter on there, didn't we? Oh, I see. Yeah, the Unwinding Constrictor. Oh, sorry, the Winding Constrictor. If one or more counters would be put on an artifact or creature you control, put that many plus one. So we ended up putting two counters on the Sack Outlet there. Let's just pass the turn like this and we can go for Proliferate if needs be. 
Already making use of our mass mana, but we need to draw into something other than lands. Okay, a vampire aristocrat. Another sack outlet. This is a free one, so better than the one we just got rid of. And they can actually buff that quite nicely, but it will only last until the end of the turn, so if we put a couple of plus counters on that, or a couple of minus counters, I should say, then as soon as it goes round to the next turn, this thing will die. Now, before we allow the Mimeoplasm to take a turn, let's go for Proliferate. And we'll discard the Ancient Tomb, don't need to be taking any unnecessary life. We'll Proliferate there. And that's all we need to do, actually, so we'll just get rid of the Oracle so they don't get too many lands out. Careful study from Mimeoplasm, that's a really good one. Draw two and discard two for only one mana. They can actually go for their Mimeoplasm here, and I think that only cares about their own graveyard. Two creature cards, no it isn't, from graveyards. So they've got their pick of things from graveyards here. I don't think we've got anything too noteworthy though. They probably only want to target their own stuff. Maybe a Fairy Artisans with some plus counters on it. But deciding not to go for their commander, just tapping out and passing the turn. Okay, a Domri Raid. That can fight, I think. Target creature you control fights another. Yeah, so they could get rid of Yargmoth if they get into a big creature. They might want to tap their... Yeah, they could actually go for Rurik Thar, couldn't they? Yeah, so they're going for Domri Raid and then going into Rurik Thar sounds like a good idea. Now what they want to fight, I don't know. We can get straight into our Yargmoth without much issue. Um, Machaeus and Genesis Chamber is actually a nice combo because... Is this on entry? Yeah, when it enters, it's not cast. So if we get into a non-human creature, we can bring it in, sacrifice it, comes back with Undying, thanks to Machaeus, and then we can sacrifice the Mere token that the Genesis Chamber will generate to the Yargmoth, Put a minus counter on the reanimated creature and do it all over again. So it will keep coming in with plus and minus counters. Or we'll knock the plus counter off it with a minus counter. So it will keep coming back with undying is what I meant. But that entails us getting into a creature. They are not going for their commander surprisingly. Going for a plus on Domri Raid. Look at the top card of your library. If it's a creature, reveal it and put it into your hand. And there we go, yeah, the Rurik Thar comes down now. Let me just remind myself. Attacks each combat available. Whenever a player casts a non-creature spell, it deals 6 damage to that player. We actually need to keep our life total quite high because of Yargmoth's ability. So getting rid of that quite quickly would be pretty good for us. Yeah, I thought they would go for Rurik Thar and then minus down the Domri to fight something, but... Apparently they don't feel the need to get rid of Machaeus. Alright, we get the Dreadhorde Invasion. Oh, that's a shame, the Rurik Thar... <laughs> okay. The Rurik Thar and the Mazarek player decide to scoop. Uh, extra plane all end. See, we're not actually drawing into anything, so... I don't know why they're scooping there, it's... Well, anyway, I'm not going to say the same thing over and over again about randoms on Modo. Let's try and get into something. We'll get rid of this flyer by sacrificing the zombie army. <laughs> we just draw into yeah, we're just drawing into mana apparently. So, uh, might as well. Yeah, we can get down the extra plane our lens, make our stuff tap for five mana instead. It might matter if we get into exsanguinate or something like that. We'll swing in with Machaeus because it has Intimidate. Oh, actually, I think the Mears can block that, can't they? What does Intimidate do? Artifacts and Black, yeah. So we just get rid of a Mere in this case. And then the Mimeoplasm player decides to scoop it up as well. Let's see what we actually would have drawn into there. Okay, Animate Dead can reanimate nothing. Uh, maybe we would have gone for Oracle or the Fairy Artisans there. Jet Medallion. Uh, land, land, Necropotence would have gotten us back into it, but we were a good few turns away from Necropotence. So yeah, three on one, 
with, let's see, that's uh, one turn, sack a zombie to draw that. Two turns, yeah, so maybe three turns before we get into Necropotence. Three on one, while we're not doing anything, yeah, perhaps they should have been able to do more than they did there. But unfortunately, sometimes a commander's reputation precedes him. And as opposed to just looking at the board state and what a player's actually doing, they just get the blinkers on and fear the commander itself and what it is capable of, as opposed to what it's actually doing. Um, yeah, so our opponent's just deciding to scoop it up there, even though we weren't really doing anything. I'm going to upload this anyway, because it shows what you can actually do with Yargmoth, and had we have gotten into some decent draws, then we certainly would have been in a way better position than we were to actually go ahead and win it. But we were just drawn into a bunch of mana for some reason, so hopefully we'll have better luck next time in the next game that you're probably about to see now. Yogmar Thran Physician versus Tatyova Benthic Druid, Dakon Blackblade, and Golos Tireless Pilgrim. Well, there's at least three really good commanders at the table. I don't know anything about Dakon Blackblade. How is that for a hand? I don't think it's particularly good, to be honest, so let's mulligan that. We get a free mulligan in multiplayer. Ugh, that's... Really, really not good. Yeah, we don't need Cabal Coffers and Cabal Stronghold, so we have to go for another mulligan, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, okay, that's better. We can get rid of the strip mine there, I think. And then we are on the play, so we'll go for the Death Greeter. And if it eats removal, then so be it. Yeah, like I said, I don't know how good Dacon is. It's power and toughness equal to the number of lands you control. Yeah, not sure how well you're going to ramp lands-wise in Esper Colours. I'd be very intrigued to see how our opponent can do with that. You can get plenty of lands out of your deck with land tax and the like, but as far as actually getting lots of lands into play faster than once a turn, yeah, I don't know how you can do that in Esper Colours. All right, just a land from Tatyova. Let's go for some card draw here. With the Knight's Whisper, we draw two and lose two. Get into a Lightning Greaves and a Glistening Oil. Glistening Oil, that goes with our Aristocrat-style creatures, some of which actually deal damage. I think this one is life loss, isn't it? Yeah, we've got a four-mana one in the deck. Uh, Vindictive Vampire is the one I'm thinking of. And that one actually deals damage. So if we can have a lot of creatures die, probably just get Vindictive Vampire out and Glistening Oil, wipe the board. If there's enough creatures in play, it will ping everyone for at least 10 and infect everyone to death. But that is a late game strategy. Poor Tent from Dacom. Look at the top three and put them back in any order. Oh, that's a target player. Yeah, they're targeting themselves. So look at the top three of a player's library, put them back in any order. You may have them shuffle. Draw a card at the beginning of next turn's upkeep. Followed by a tapped Shockland. So four tapped Shocklands coming into play so far. Then Dakon draws that card from the portent at the beginning of Tatyova's turn. Expect to see some ramp from Tatyova this turn. Nope, we're not seeing any ramp from Tatyova. They might be holding on to counter magic. So let's just... We'll get a Shockland, or a Fetchland even, into the graveyard in case we draw into Crucible. And you never know, someone might drop something that stops us activating fetches or makes activating fetches cost two or something like that. So we'll just get it out of the way now. Then we'll go Lightning Greaves and we'll put that on the Death Greeter. Don't think I'm going to go in for Yargmoth next turn because there's not really anything for us to do with Yargmoth. We need to get into our token producers. So it just goes to show the last game we got into Sol Ring and got a hell of a lot going. Very, very quickly. And then this game is much slower. The fast mana really, really warps the game. A Rings of Bright Hearth for Golos. That is no doubt to copy Golos' ability. Not seeing any ramp from Golos though, which you won't find me complaining about. I don't think they've got green yet. It's difficult to tell which Shocklands these are, because they all look the same to me. Yeah, no green yet. 
Keeper of the Nine Gales from Dacon. And then, oh, this might be Bird Tribal then. I mean, it has to be Bird Tribal, doesn't it? And then Crop Rotation from the uh, Tatyelva player at the end of Dacon's turn. They're going for Ancient Tomb. Drop a forest that they already had in hand, I imagine. And then going in for more ramp in explosive vegetation, so we may well be seeing Tatyova next turn. Okay, well, we are not doing very well. I'm getting in two token producers, unfortunately, but does Zulaport deal damage? I think this is life loss as well. Yeah, so these two aristocrat effects are life loss. It is specifically the four mana one that deals damage. And that does matter when you're talking about glistening oil. So let's go for... Yeah, let's just go for Zula Port Cutthroat. Actually, we'll go for Blood Artist. It's more relevant because it cares about other people's creatures dying. We actually don't have a sack outlet or any of our own stuff to kill off yet, so Zula Port Cutthroat might be more relevant later on. Uh, let's protect the Blood Artist and pass the turn. Finally, getting into that green mana that he needs. Still can't cast Golos currently though. But one more land and next turn they'll be able to cast Golos. And then we can all start worrying. Okay, Shalai, Voice of Plenty. Might give us a little peek into what they want to do with Golos. Although this could be a generic protect Golos from spot removal type effect. Although in my experience Golos doesn't mind being sent back to the command zone. Because you just get to recast it and... Grab another land out of your library. A tap land from the Esper player. And deciding to hold back on the bird. They may be holding up counter magic though. And that looks like Tatyova mana to me. It certainly is. Can they do anything with that one mana is the question. I think they would have gotten down exploration sooner than this. No, nope, they were saving a land drop as they should. Tatyova gains them a life and draws them a card. Tatyova's one of my favourite commanders and I've never run it in multiplayer, so I have to do that sometime soon. Elvish Visionary will draw them a card as well. Okay, just more mana for us in Charcoal Diamond. This is uh, yeah, pretty similar to what happened last game, actually. But we'll be able to get our commander out again if it dies. Um... Do we care about Zulaport Cutthroat? We might want to use that as a combo piece later on if we can get infinite death triggers. So let's just leave Zulaport Cutthroat for now. At least, considering that we are a Yogmoth player, at least we should be getting left alone. People should be turning their attention elsewhere, I think, based solely on what we've been doing so far. Although I suppose it only takes a couple of good draws for us to start doing some obnoxious things. It's also noteworthy that Dacon has left up counter magic. And it's Golo Super Friends, apparently. Does this. You and Planeswalkers you control have hexproof, so yeah, that was a clue towards what type of deck this is. Won't be able to use spot removal on the Planeswalkers whilst the Shalai is in play. I didn't add Call to the Gatewatch in my Super Friends deck because I'd rather just use a generic tutor, like a demonic tutor or something. This does give away what you're going for over Demonic Shooter and the like. They searched for Kiora, the Crashing Wave, one of my favourite Planeswalkers. I think before the Nissa that gets you an emblem with Landfall draw a card. Before that came out, I think this is my most successful emblem. The one that I've gotten off the most times, at least. They did miss a land drop, which is noteworthy, so... They couldn't have played Golos had they wanted to. They can at least get down Kiora next turn though. Sacrificing the Grasslands to grab a Plains or a Forest. So yeah, going for a Plains there. They grab Tundra. Then grab themselves a Crow of Dark Tidings. When it enters or dies, put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. So yeah, pretty strange deck they've got so far. Some Self Mill. Self-mill bird tribal. I don't really see what you can get out of self-mill bird tribal. Maybe you wanna, maybe you wanna reanimate a heap of birds with a living death or something. That'd be pretty funny. Now let's see how much damage Tatyova can deal here. Seven cards in hand, and a bunch of mana. Temple of the False God is even more mana. 
Uh, nature's Law is going to be Landfall again, so they're keeping a lot of mana in play, and they're keeping their hand full at the same time. Plus gaining a life every time a land comes in as well, because apparently Landfall draw a card isn't good enough. You need to tack the life gain on there as well. Just imagine what Tatyova could have done if she wasn't uncommon. Okay, get back round on to our turn. We, guess what? Draw into more mana. I think we just have to go for our commander here. If it gets countered, then it gets it out of someone's hand at least. But we're doing nothing else at this point. Okay, so successfully comes down. We'll try and put the greaves on. Okay, vents are coming down. Let's crack that for a land. Because we may well want to sacrifice a creature. We'll see what they're trying to bounce. It's probably the Yargmoth, but we'll see what their aim is here. Yep, they're pointing it at Yargmoth. We could sacrifice the Blood Artist to draw a card. Put a minus counter on something and then proliferate, but yeah, I don't really care. We'll just let that happen, I think. Uh, no, actually. Oh, I thought they were pointing that at the Yargmoth. They're actually pointing it at the Lightning Greaves. Uh, now, does the Esper player have counter magic? I think we're just... Well, we have to allow that. There's nothing we can do about it. So that fizzles the ability. We'll just replay the Greaves here. I think they should have gone for bouncing Yargmoth there. But maybe they want to bounce counter the Lightning Greaves. Well, Greaves comes down. Let's see if there's any more answers. Yeah, we didn't actually care about the two mana there. So, recasting the Greaves just to get the uh, protection onto Yargmoth. Puts us in exactly the same position as we would have been had the Vencer not have come down. Now, I think bouncing the Yargmoth there would have slowed us down way more. Now then, is Kiora going to enter play here? She certainly is. That's our opponent's play for the turn. Doesn't look like they've got a land. And it might be worth putting a counter onto the Shalai here to encourage the Tatyova to swing in towards Kiora. Oh, but they actually go for the minus there. Trying to get into a land, I dare say. You may play an additional land, draw a card. And yeah, Super Friends, where the Rings of Bright Hearth in play is quite scary. Still not getting into a land, though, I don't think. So they just leave back Shalai and pass the turn again, not having the best of luck with their mana. Which is very unusual in a Golos deck. So, ironically, it's actually the Esper player that is doing quite well on lands. We're not doing too bad ourselves with mana because it's pretty much all we've drawn into. Thieving Magpie. Whenever it deals damage to an opponent, draw a card or 1-3 flyer. And again, just deciding to pass the turn after they've played their bird. Our land comes down, gains tack your life and draws a card. Still at 7 cards in hand. Ooh, Teferi, Mage of Zalfir. Each opponent can cast spells only any time they could cast a sorcery. Well, it doesn't affect abilities at least. Yeah, but that is a relevant card though. We want rid of that. And then tapping out by the looks of it. Let's see if it's for a spell or not. It is a knowledge pool. When it enters the battlefield, each player exiles the top three. And imprints them onto knowledge pool. Whenever a player casts a spell from their hand, that player exiles it. And if the player does, they may cast another non-land card exiled with Knowledge Pool without paying the mana cost. Hmm, okay, that should be interesting. Okay, the Keeper of the Nine Gales is going to return the Teferi back to hand. Oh, I see. Does Knowledge Pool combo with that? Does Knowledge Pool say that... Yeah, it might be that we can't cast anything with Knowledge Pool while Teferi's in play. Oh, actually, no. If it's Sorcery Speed... Yeah, I don't know how that works. But clearly the bird player wanted rid. Oh, wow. And Golo scooping. Yeah, that's why you don't scoop early. Underestimated the bird player there. Knowledge pool being countered. And Teferi being dealt with for a turn as well. So the bird player doing some work here. Now then, let's see if we draw into another land. Okay, Ogre Slumlord. Whenever another non-token creature dies... You get a black rat token. That is actually pretty good. So let's get that down. 
we're going to have to kill off our Death Greeter here, I think. So let's go... Yeah, we'll kill off the Elvish Visionary just to get a token with the Ogre Slumlord. Let's sacrifice the Death Greeter. Worst case scenario, we can reanimate the Death Greeter. And we'll point this at the Tatyova player. So we get a Rat Token. Blood Artist will drain our opponent. And Yargmoth puts the minus counter on the Elvish Visionary. That draws us a card and triggers the Blood Artist again. As well as the Olga Slumlord. We don't draw into a land for the turn, unfortunately. Let's point... Yeah, let's point a counter at the Tat Yolva. Get rid of a rat. One of our creatures has died, so that triggers the Blood Artist. Okay, and Tat Yolva deciding to scoop up as well. God, welcome to Magic Online. Wow. I'm pretty sure Tat Yolva had a full grip there as well. Two card combo. I don't know what our opponent's referring to there. We have a lot of interaction all of a sudden, but it's not really a combo. We can't kill off everything. We could kill off that bird and keep going, but yeah, our opponent didn't allow us to draw there. Well, seeing as how it's 1v1, I was going to leave the bird player alone, but let's get rid of this rat. The rat will replace itself because it kills off a bird, but this isn't a combo. We actually need to kill things off for Olga Slumlord to die. The crow will trigger and mill some more. Okay, not getting into a land for the turn, unfortunately. Do we want to reanimate anything? I don't think we really care, to be honest. So let's move that over to the Olga Slumlord. And we'll swing him for five points of damage. Yeah, the Golos player scooped because they saw the Knowledge Pool and the Teferi. Little did they know that the bird player was going to counter the knowledge pool. And then tack Yova scooping because they thought we had a combo that we actually don't have. So it's just many of the trials and tribulations of playing Magic Online, unfortunately. We'll see what this Esper player can do with four cards in hand. Oh, and they've got the Mana Drain as well. This is going to be six mana. Deep Analysis going to try and get into some answers. They can go for the flashback on that this turn if they want to and still have mana held up. Soul Catcher. Whenever a creature with flying dies, put a plus counter on the Soul Catcher. Okay. Well, we can kill that off pretty easily. Yeah. The Esper player has been left in the lurch by the other players here. A Psionic Blast is 4 damage to any target. That gets rid of our Ogre Slumlord. Our opponent's full of... Full of answers here. Let's get rid of the rat, get rid of the bird. Like I said, the Ogre Slumlord will see the bird die and the rat replaces itself instantly. So we might as well get the card draw here before the Slumlord dies. Yet again, the bird player has an answer for Ogre Slumlord, which is a supposed combo. So Tatyova, had they have stuck it out, would have seen the Ogre Slumlord die and... I imagine Tatyova would have gone on to win the game, to be honest, but we'll never know now. Okay, Seaside Haven in response is two tap, sack a bird, draw a card. Oh, didn't know that that land did that, so that will counter our Yargmoth. Because they sacrificed the, um, the bird that we were targeting. So they go back up to four cards. We get more Blood Artist triggers. Yargmoth is countered. And that gets rid of our Ogre Slumlord. I think we're going to reanimate that next turn. Blood Artist triggering yet again because of the Ogre Slumlord dying. And then swinging in at us for the card draw. So putting a minus counter on that sounds like a good idea. In fact, we could do that right now, couldn't we? Let's put the minus counter on it. It'll draw us a card. Gain us life. And it will take the power off of this thing so it can't deal damage to us and draw our opponent a card. We get into Astral Cornucopia. Not getting into the lands all of a sudden. We're either getting flooded with lands or we can't draw into them. There we go. So we'll play that immediately. Let's grab ourselves an Ogre Slumlord. 
Then I think it's Astral Cornucopia. Just so that we can start making our proliferates count. Then we'll go for the Zulaport Cutthroat, just so that we can sacrifice it. And we'll put a minus counter on that thing. And then we can start getting our little machine gun going again. It is a very potent combination of cards, but it's not quite a combo. Uh, we get into Liliana of the Dark Realms again, so let's go for the proliferation on Yargmoth. Discard the... I don't think we're going to make use of Glistening Oil, so we'll discard that to proliferate. Put a counter on the Astral Cornucopia and a couple of counters here. And say done, triggering both those creatures yet again. And then we'll again put the boots onto the Slumlord. And we'll swing in for some damage. Then put the Greaves back over onto Yargmoth and pass the turn. We don't necessarily need to sacrifice a rat to get rid of the Thieving Magpie because we can rely on the Proliferate for that. But we've actually got Sack Outlets to put a minus counter on that if we want to just for the card draw. Whenever a bird is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, put a feather counter on this, and birds you control get plus one plus one per feather counter on it. Yeah, bird tribal's pretty good apparently, isn't it? Okay, they're tapping their sack outlet, which is good. Oh, and moat. Creatures without flying can't attack. Yeah, this is a really interesting deck by my opponent. I think it was underestimated by everyone, including me. Uh, yeah, still don't think we need to... Put a minus counter onto that thing just yet. But as a mono black player, we're definitely not going to be dealing with Moat. I think we need to rely on Blood Artist. Might have to get back the Zulaport Cutthroat with the Animate Dead. Just to double up on these uh, Aristocrat effects. Okay, well there's Necropotence. That's a means of us getting into a lot of cards. Let's draw another one. We'll put one on this Thieving Magpie. Doesn't matter if we sack a rat, if we can't block with it. We can always tutor for Meteor Golem, if we're desperate for the moat. Oh, and should have gone for the reanimate first as well, for more um, for more aristocrat effects. Get into a land. Alright, let's go for the Jet Medallion. Followed by a 1 mana Demonic Tutor. And I think just going for Meteor Golem's okay. Might be a waste of a tutor, but we can get rid of the moat at least. So we'll drop the Meteor Golem, get rid of the Moat. And then we can sacrifice the Meteor Golem and reanimate it if we want to. Yeah, our opponent decides to call it a day there. That was their last ditch attempt at drawing the game to a close. Or at least dragging the game out long enough to, um, to maybe get something going. We were just going to put the Greaves onto Meteor Golem there. And then swing in for 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 points. And then swing in again next turn. And that's the game. This is the best I could do with this recording session. Uh, we had some more salty players there, unfortunately, so hopefully you all got some enjoyment from the games anyway. I am trying to get more multiplayer games out for all of you, as you have all requested. But as we have seen here, it can be quite difficult. So by the time we get up to 4,000 subscribers, hopefully we can have a Discord and all play with each other. I'll set up a Patreon then as well, so if you want to help out the channel, and get us up to that 4,000 subscribers, please consider subscribing and liking and commenting and all that stuff that YouTubers ask you to do because it does help out the channel and it does tell YouTube's algorithm to push the videos and get them out to more new people that haven't seen them before. So that's why I ask you to do that and it would genuinely be very helpful. So if you could do that, I would be eternally grateful to you. I'm Tribal Kai on the EDH channel. Thank you for watching.